All right, so UPX is available from SourceForge. <coughs> It's actually, you know, it's the hello world of Packers, basically. It's very easy to understand because it isn't explicitly malicious. It really is just a thing for compressing files and letting them decompress. They have an odd packing functionality. So if you pack something with UPX, you just use UPX-D to decompress it, and it'll do that nicely. So it's very simple to understand because it's not trying to obfuscate. It's not trying to use TLS to play any tricks on the analyst or anything like that. And so the basic usage of it is you just say UPX and the file you want to pack and the output file that you want to write it to. And if you use dash D, you can go ahead and unpack uh, a packed file. So what I want to show now is the header changes that are made on ELF specifically. So we're going to start with ELF and we'll go back to, uh, we'll go back to PE files later. All right, so I said before, I've got hello static. It's a big, giant hello world that takes up 725K, right? And so when I run hello static through UPX, UPX-O, hello static-UPX file, like that, and hello static, oops. I already exists. Let's pretend that it just created that file. Oh, hey, I've got UPX static. I'll just call it, fine. Just to show you, I'll call it hello static UPX2. All right, so it goes through its process, compressing it down. Whatever algorithm, I think it may use LZMA these days. I'm not sure. Actually, I think they have their own custom compression. All right, so. Kind of funny, actually. It compressed to different sizes at different times. I may have used a different option last time, but the point is, whereas something took around, you know, 400, 740K before, after we use UPX, it takes around 280K, right, 286K. So you've got significant savings. You know, it's less than half the size that it used to be. So this is a good thing if you're in a space-constrained environment. But let's try to understand what the changes were that it made to the headers, that it manipulated in order to, you know, have this compressed version. So if we look at, with readelf-l on the original hello static, the things that we really care about are those load segments, right? The original thing had a file offset going from 0 to A0BD9. That's going to be the first segment. It's going to map that segment to... 400,000, right? The second thing starts at A0F0, and it's a much smaller segment. It's only DB0 big, and it's going to map that at 6A0F0. So kind of like we've been seeing, we've got one segment around 400,000, one segment around 600,000. The first one's big, second one's small. This is more just a, a function of this particular Hello World program. So the first segment is readable and executable. Second segment is readable and writable. So you expect that that first big thing has all the code and stuff in there because it's executable. And the second thing is going to have, you know, data, the dot data section, the dot RO data section, and stuff like that. It's readable and writable, but not executable. All right, so that's the original Hello Static big giant Hello World. Now let's look at the Hello Static UPX. All right, so first of all, we have no section information, right? So there's no mapping between segments and sections. So let's even look back at the uh, header information for this. Right? What is the, you know, number of section headers? Zero. Right? What is, there should be an offset section headers, which should be zero as well, right? Start of section headers, size of section headers. There's no section headers on this binary. There's no mapping, there's no more granular view where you can figure out here's the dot text section. Here's the, you know, dot got dot plt. Here's the symbol table. There's nothing like that. You just got two big blobs of file data that are going to get mapped into memory. All right, so here's our two big blobs. And how do they differ? Well, the first one goes from 0 to 3fa25. It's mapped to 40,000 again. And the second one 
goes from A4 DA8, but it's got a file size of zero, and it's got a mem size of zero. So this is kind of weird. It's got a segment that is going to start at some particular file offset. It's not going to read anything in from file, but it's going to map itself to a particular virtual address. And so the reason behind this is, uh, to some degree, I believe it's because, if I'm remembering correctly from back when I was playing around with this sort of thing, uh, if you don't have two segments, uh, the program simply won't work. I don't think you can actually get the program to run with a single segment. So it's doing this partially because it needs two segments, but partially it's doing this because even though it's asked for zero file size, and even though it's asked for zero memory size, it's still, the OS loader, because it saw a load segment, is going to actually map some, is going to uh, allocate some space at that particular location. So that memory is going to be mapped. There's not going to be any file data there. It's not going to be using any virtual data. But like in terms of the backend memory management, that's going to be some memory space that's allocated. So you could touch that data. You could read data. You could write data right there. And so it's kind of like it's allocating hex 1000 worth of memory there in reality behind the scenes. It's not taking anything from disk and putting it there. But when the packer starts running, you'll actually see that it'll copy data into this region, even though there's nothing there, because it knows implicitly behind the scenes the OS loader still made that memory valid. At least hex 1000 of that memory is valid. So it's basically going to have one big segment where it has all of its stuff, and then one segment that's ostensibly of zero size. But when you actually watch the thing run, you'll see it copy itself. It'll start at itself and then copy some stuff down. It'll copy itself over there. And then that's going to be the decompression program that's going to run off in that memory. And then it's going to decompress that other blob into the original space starting around 400,000. And then uh, based on that, the original program will run. I believe when it's done, it is going to copy some stuff into the 600,000 range as well, because the original Hello Static had stuff in the 600,000 range. But this is where my, my memory of exactly what's happening here is, uh, is has decayed. All right, so this is just notionally, these are the kind of changes that a packer will make to the headers. It'll, it'll make some space for uh, the data. And it is going to decompress that data into a large uh, range of memory. So this is UPX on Linux. UPX on Windows is going to behave basically the same way. I'm going to show you that quick as well. And we'll see the, the, the changes made to the headers. All right. All right, so I just took my template32.exe. And I ran that through UPX. It said it had a compression ratio. Moved from 6656 bytes down to 5120 bytes. So the final size is 77% of the original size. I'm going to look at it in CFF Explorer. This is crashing, apparently. Other CFF Explorer. So in my downloads, I got EPX. That and that. All right, so this is our original. Uh, template32.exe, we go look at the section headers. You see it's got a .text section, which starts at 1000 and goes for A0, or sorry, goes for 804 in memory. Got the R data, starts at 2000, goes for 5D4. Dot .data, 3000 to 384. Resource and relocation information. In the UPX one, it's nice and clear here. We've got one section that has a name of UPX0, one section that has a name of UPX1. All right, now relative to the original one, the first section starts at hex 1000, and it goes for 6000. So the original one started at 1000 and goes to 804. So if we start at 1000 and go to 6000, we'll actually cover all of this data, right? So if the original file like we said, you know, what's the size of image? The size of image is go to this last section and add the total size of the, the virtual memory. So total size of image here is like 5194, right? But UPX is allocating its first UPX0 section with a total size of 6,000. So this is more than enough to cover all of the memory space that this original program 
would have taken up. So it's got enough space to like actually map everything in there. All right. <coughs> And it's got UPX1 at uh, virtual address 7,000, total size of 1,000 in memory, size of, well, okay, what I didn't point out here before is this first section, it's got a raw size, a size of raw data, so how much stuff are we going to read off of disk and copy into memory? Zero bytes, actually. So this is a section which all it does is allocate space, but it doesn't copy any stuff into that space. That's like that second segment that you saw over in the uh, in the Linux thing, and that confirms, as I suspected, that I was misdescribing where stuff was going to go. So the other Linux thing, the segment that has zero size, that's what it's going to use for memory. But anyways, so over here on uh, on Windows, you've got the first section that's just allocating space but not copying any data in there, and then we've got the uh, second thing that has C0 worth of uh, data that it's going to read off the file. And yeah, and it's at 7,000, so it's beyond the address range of the original executable. And then finally, there's the resource. Uh, UPX has the option to compress the resources or not compress the resources. It's just kind of sometimes it'll mess up the program whether you pack the resources or not. And so most packers will give you the option whether you want to compress or not compress the resource section. So here, I believe it's just going to have tacked on the resources more or less as is. So let's see. It started at 8,000. It goes to 1,000, size of 400. And the original one, resource, was, you know, total size of uh, 200. So it's got more than enough space for the resource. Actually, now I'm kind of curious whether, the, whether it really is the exact same thing. Yep, so there's the manifest. And in this one, there's the manifest, right? So it's keeping the resources, quote, in the clear, right? It's keeping the resource information outside of the compressed blob, just in case it's necessary. Because actually this manifest information is used by, uh, potentially used by the OS loader. So sometimes you want that information to be available ahead of time to set some configuration information, essentially. But that's beyond the scope. All right, so again, just at the section have header level, we can see that UPX allocates enough space to cover all of the memory range of the original executable, and then it's going to just have a second segment or a section which has uh, the real data, and that data will uh, decompress the data into the original virtual memory space so that everything maps up to the same offsets that it would have had if you executed the original file. So, all right, so any questions on the concept of packing, this notion that we're like, compressing down all of the data from an original file and then decompressing it back into the correct location in memory at runtime with some little stub code that does decompression. Any questions about that? Not really a question so much as a comment and or discussion. I'm really surprised that packers operate this way, that is, uh, duplicating so many of the functions of the operating system when it would seem much simpler uh, just to decompress a file, write a write that file, and then hand it to the operating system to do these functions. Do I understand that correctly? And if so, do you have any idea why they do it this way? Yep, so that's actually, we would call what you just described more like a dropper. So uh, in the reverse engineering class, the intro to reverse engineering class, uh, Matt Briggs and Frank Posluzny, they cover sort of droppers. And so a dropper would, for instance, pull something out of the resource section and drop it and then uh, you know, decompress it or decrypt it and things like that, drop it on the file system and then put it up. The core benefit that you get from a packer versus a dropper is the real, quote, real executable never touches disk. If you've got a dropper, then you're dumping the thing off to the file system. And even if you delete it, right, file system forensics can potentially recover that. So you just wrote the original file to disk, and then you just executed it. That original file, even when it's deleted, you know, it still potentially is resident in the sectors on hard drive, so file system forensics can find it. When you just decompress it into memory using this, you know, rigmarole of reconstructing stuff the way the OS would. When you do it that way, you make sure that the, quote, original program that you're trying to protect never was actually visible on the file system. So it's, you know, pretty ephemeral. 
someone shuts down the machine, they'd never get a copy of the original thing. So that said, they still would potentially have a copy of the compressed thing, and they can still work through the analysis process of deriving the original file. So again, it's basically the, the I would say it's primarily due to, you know, malware authors wanting to avoid file system forensics and the, the potential for evidence showing up later of what the original file did. Yeah, that's a good uh, comment. Yes. Also, if you're using the standard OS uh, loading mechanism, doesn't it get logged? The, the packed file, it depends on what you mean by logged, right? Well, it's like if you, if you, you load a kernel or something like that, it gets logged that that kernel has been loaded. If you do it through like a DLL injection, then you can avoid all logging. Well, so, yeah, it really comes down to your assumptions of how the system is configured and what sort of logging is going on. But in the sense of the difference between a dropper and a packer, a packer runs itself this, you know, template32 upx.exe, the invocation of that process would still get logged, right? Just like, but now if we were doing a dropper, you would see, you know, the dropper load and then it would, ex it would drop the file and then load that so you'd see two versus one. Whether or not that's any sort of uh, thing that would be useful for defenders, I don't think is necessarily the case because, you know, it's just some random binary and implicitly just saying a log file of, you know, this hash binary ran or not, didn't run. It's useful in like an application whitelisting sort of environment. But like just if there's just a log file that says some random file name executable ran, I don't think there would really be any difference between a dropper version versus a, uh, a packed version. There's no real difference in terms of protection for the, for the malware. Basically. 